My name is Eric Kazarian. I'm an otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, also known as an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and one of the relatively few surgeons in the world that specializes in the surgical treatment of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. In this video, I will explain my approach to evaluating patients and the selection of individual procedures and oral appliances to treat individual patients. This is one of the most important things in sleep surgery, the most popular topic on which I give lectures around the world, and the main reason that other physicians, including other surgeons, refer patients to come see me. Although I do perform more snoring and sleep apnea procedures than most other surgeons, the key to getting the best results for my patients is not just the ability to perform a wide range of procedures, but also the understanding of how to select the treatments that are going to provide the most benefit for each patient. Each patient is different, so I make decisions with my patients about what might work best for them. Although this video only scratches the surface, I want to share enough about the selection of sleep surgery procedures so that you will end up knowing more than many physicians. I have previously discussed the role of behavior changes and positive airway pressure therapy. The other two categories of treatment for both snoring and obstructive sleep apnea are surgery and oral appliances. They are very different from positive airway pressure in that with positive airway pressure therapy, the air is delivered basically to balloon open the throat regardless of where the blockage of breathing is occurring. With surgery and oral appliances, it is critical to determine the major areas or structures where the blockage of breathing occurs because there are many possible procedures, each working slightly differently. When we breathe at night, ideally we are breathing through our nose, with air flowing through our nose, our throat, and then into our lungs through our windpipe or trachea. There are three major regions where blockage or narrowing of the breathing passages can occur. The first is the nasal region. The second is the area up high in the throat, behind the roof of the mouth and involving the tonsils, what I call the palate region here. The third area is the tongue region, down lower in the throat, behind the tongue and a structure called the epiglottis, which works as a trap door that covers your voice box when you swallow so the food and liquids don't go down the wrong way into your lungs. My research and the work of others have shown that more than one of these areas is involved in most patients with obstructive sleep apnea and many with snoring who do not have sleep apnea. This is important because we only achieve the best results if we treat all areas that contribute to the problem. If you think of the breathing passages as a tube or pipe with three potential areas of blockage, if you don't have all of them open, then the tube or pipe will still be blocked. When considering procedures or an oral appliance, you have to understand that each has their own effect on different parts of the breathing passages in the nose and throat and that a key to achieving our goals is selecting the right treatments in a plan that is matched to each patient. I do this through careful evaluation and the ability to perform a wide range of procedures. For snoring and sleep apnea, the focus has been in performing surgery on the soft palate because that is where the snoring sound often comes from. However, studies have shown that treating the soft palate produces great results in some patients and minimal to no benefit in others. Clearly, successful treatment of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea requires a more thorough evaluation than just a cookie cutter approach to treating everyone the same way. As I mentioned, determining the pattern of airway blockage in the treatment of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea is a major part of what I do in treating patients and in my research. There are many ways to select treatments and I generally use a combination because no single evaluation is perfect. In all areas of medicine, the first step is taking a careful history. This includes detailed questions about snoring, sleep apnea, other sleep disorders, nasal or sinus issues, and a full medical history. This is followed by a thorough physical examination focusing on the head and neck, which can involve something called flexible endoscopy. I can learn a lot from basic physical examination, but a flexible endoscopy involves inserting a flexible telescope into both sides of the nose, and then on one side going deeper to look into the throat to allow me to see the entire upper airway from the tip of the nose to the larynx or voice box. Normally this would be uncomfortable because we were not made to have telescopes put into our nose, but a standard part of the preparation for this exam is to spray some medications into the nose to create more space for the telescope and then the lining in order to make it much more comfortable. Flexible endoscopy complements the routine physical examination and is usually very helpful to obtain a general sense of what might be occurring during sleep and how to proceed with treatment. 
Flexible endoscopy in the office tells me quite a bit, but patients are still awake. What I really want to know, especially for patients with sleep apnea, is what is happening in my patients' throats when they sleep. I joke with my patients that I could come to their home and put the flexible telescope in their nose to watch inside their throat all night long, every night for a week, but nobody would like that very much. Instead, I can perform an evaluation that with some European colleagues I have named drug-induced sleep endoscopy. It requires going to the operating room where patients receive sedation just enough to drift off so that I can place the telescope to watch their throats as they have the same kinds of blockage of breathing that they have every night at home during sleep. Drug-induced sleep endoscopy is not a substitute for a sleep study that evaluates breathing patterns. A sleep study is still needed to make the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. However, a sleep study tells us almost nothing about where the blockage of breathing is occurring or about selecting surgical procedures or an oral appliance. This is the purpose of drug-induced sleep endoscopy. And my own research and that from colleagues around the world has shown that if you do it carefully and properly, you can use sedation to create something similar to sleep and obtain useful information to guide treatment decisions in sleep apnea. Our studies clearly show that people vary quite a bit in terms of what is happening during sleep and that different people have blockage in breathing for different reasons. This is why we do not use the same surgical treatment plan for every patient. Some of the common structures that are involved in causing blockage of breathing are the soft palate, tongue, epiglottis, and the sides of the throat, also called the lateral pharyngeal walls. These differences in the structures that contribute to blockage of breathing during sleep may explain some of the wide range in results seen for different surgeries and oral appliances. For example, if someone has the tongue playing a role in their sleep apnea, you have to treat the tongue. In certain cases, studies have shown that drug-induced sleep endoscopy uniquely can be very helpful in choosing or not choosing certain procedures and oral appliances. Research continues here and in other leading centers around the world regarding these and other evaluation techniques, and I use the latest findings as I strive for the best possible results in my patients. I believe that improvements in evaluation are the key to enhancing outcomes with available procedures and developing new treatments that offer greater benefits and or lower risks. My approach is about not only being able to perform a wide range of snoring and sleep apnea procedures, but also providing the best possible evaluation before surgery. Being recognized as one of the world's leaders in the field is based on this commitment to the most sophisticated in evaluation techniques, procedure selection, measurement of results, and new technologies. I hope you enjoyed this video and continue to the others that explore treatment options for snoring and obstructive sleep apnea in the nasal, palate, and tongue regions.